thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, uh, and let me let me add my thanks to Lori Palmer, uh, with whom it's been a real pleasure to work uh, in conceptualizing and organizing this two-quarter-long uh, extraction research project uh, and its present two-day conference. So thanks so much, Lori, for your uh, contributions to this. <clears throat> and let me extend my uh, profound thanks to all of the speakers and participants and uh, assistance that we've gotten with this conference. It's, it's really great to see everyone here. We're really excited uh, for what will be, I'm sure, an amazing uh, two days. Um, so the genesis of the project's conceptualization occurred uh, during the unfolding of the Standing Rock struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline, pitting indigenous water protectors against the incursions of the petro-capitalist corporate state. That conflict has been set within the conditions of the recent intensification of energy security, directed toward emancipating the U.S. from dependence on foreign oil in the post-9-11 context by developing national energy resources abetted by new technologies of extreme drilling and processes of, of dirty and hard-to-reach fossil fuel reserves reached via horizontal offshore and deep-sea drilling, fracking, steam injection, and other technologies. That discourse of energy security developed under Bush uh, and then President Obama, who memorably summed up his position on fossil fuel extraction as all options are on the table. Uh, perhaps explains why it took Obama so long to block energy transfer partners from going ahead with a Dakota Access Pipeline, some eight months into the no dapple struggle. And now, in retrospect, it's clear that energy security prepared the ground for the current agenda of economic nationalism under Trump, who in his first days in office revived the DAPL pipeline along with the Keystone XL, uh, defining early on his administration's commitment to extraction, and in doing so, it has explicitly rejected the dire warnings of climate scientists as much as the protests against the institutionalized racism built on centuries of colonialism and genocide, which that economy has grown out of and continues to advance, all pretty clear in the case of the state's treatment of the great Sioux Nation and allied Native American nations during the 2016 resistance, which, which of course continues to this day. In other words, uh, Lori and I, at the beginning of our project, were hypothesizing that extraction, far from being sidelined by the supposed new digital economies of immateriality and virtuality was rather at the center of the historically unprecedented contemporary crisis brought about by current formations of capitalism, a multifaceted crisis that looms and spreads ecologically and environmentally as much as economically and socially. Isn't it behind the current expansion of wealth inequality beyond grotesque levels, a world where the eight richest people we've learned recently own as much wealth as its bottom half. Uh, and they own it, let, let us remember, because of the structural impoverishment of those 3.6 billion people. Uh, as much as it's a matter of the growth of the privatized prison industrial complex and its forced labor system that helps regulate that inequality. Uh, doesn't extraction identify the neo-slavery of industrial agricultural labor as much as the unpaid domestic work of so many undocumented people and women? If extraction's fundamental logic is one of withdrawal, as Lori mentioned, the withdrawal of value, nutrients, energy, labor, and time from people and lands and culture, life forms, the elements, a withdrawal without corresponding deposit except the deposit of externalities of non-value in the form of pollution and waste, climate change, illness, and death, then we find its digital varieties in data mining and exploitable social media, as much as in the biogenetic applications of human organ and tissue harvesting, in addition to the bioinformatics of the security sector, and of course the neoliberal universities' mass production of debt. Extraction is literally everywhere. It's therefore not surprising to us that in a recent special issue of the journal Cultural Studies, the authors Sandra Mazadra and Brett Nielsen propose that extractivism has become, in their words, the dominant paradigm of contemporary capitalism and neoliberalism. That is, as long as one doesn't limit its definition to a single sector, uh, such as the primary forms of extraction, 
being the primitive accumulation of raw materials and life forms from the Earth's surface, depths, and biosphere. That said, while we have no wish to restrict our definition to literal extraction, we do think it's instructive and politically enabling, and this is at the basis of our project, to investigate the dirty substances and leaky processes, the oily and dusty and laborious materialities, as well as their racially and economically differentiated effects on human communities and their destructive impacts on biodiverse ecosystems and elements and realms of life beyond the human, and their climatological consequences on the very viability of life's chances of flourishing into the future. This sensation is especially urgent given our dominant culture's tendency to live as if in a psychotic state of denial about its biophysical condition, as if our heads are collectively in the cloud, as if the cloud has no basis in the forced labor found in geopolitically and militarily enforced sacrifice zones such as the Congo, where masses of people dedicate their precarious existence to digging up the rare earths that enable our advanced computer technologies, turning workers, as Ashil Mbembe writes, into metal people and mineral people and money people in an act of necropolitical desubjectification. So we think it's worth pausing, in other words, to direct our sensibilities toward the experiential and conceptual terms of extraction. And to do so, we've invited a range of amazing artists with sensitized relations to the sensory realm of matter, committed activists attentive to extraction, sociopolitical and economic arrangements and complexities, and embattled members of frontline communities, including indigenous ones, with direct knowledge of opposing extraction and living otherwise. The goal is to share and learn what's happening to our world, as well as to hear what other worlds are possible. If extraction is a one-way street of capitalist valorization and the generalized withdrawal of value from everything, what would it mean to live according to creative ecologies of mutualism, reciprocity, love, and care? What would it mean to live non-extractively? That's my brief introduction, um, and I think we'll, we'll unpack this and hear a lot more about uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, all, all the stuff that I tried to cram in there in the next couple days. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Jason Moore, who is an environmental and world historian at Binghamton University, where he is associate profess professor of sociology and a research fellow at the Fernand Brudel uh, Center. He's author, as many of us will know, of Capitalism in the Web of Life uh, from 2015 and the editor of Anthropocene or Capitalocene, Nature, History, and the Crisis of Capitalism uh, from 2016. So please join me in welcoming Jason Moore. <laughs> 